Welcome to Your Need to Know. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and today we're going to be talking about Formed Families Forward, a very unique nonprofit. And joining me today is Kelly Henderson, who's the Executive Director, and Dee Robinson Rukowski, who is a former board chair. Thank you, ladies, so much for joining me. Thank you for having us. So it's very unique how I discovered you. I discovered you at a board of Fairfax County Board of Supervisors meeting because you were being recognized during Adoption Month. And they said something about your organization and the unique nature of your organization. So I stopped you and said, let's exchange cards because I want to find out more about what you do. So I do think it's very unique, your organization. It is about foster families. But give us a little background on to how your organization came about. Sure, sure. I'm glad you, you stopped me because we're really uh, glad to share information about our organization and help other families know more about us. Um, so a group of moms, um, we were all moms, that are formed through foster care and adoption. Our families are all, were all raising children with special needs of all kinds. Um, we got together in 2011 and we're sort of commiserating around some of the challenges that our families faced. Um, we recognize that while we're in a very resource-rich area here in Northern Virginia, there really was a big gap in services and supports, particularly to families that were raising children with special needs in families that were formed through foster care, adoption, and kinship care. Um, so we, we were sort of just pooled our resources. We began doing sort of pro bono consultation and training, really focused on what we're calling sort of extra special needs um, children uh, that have disabilities and special needs, but also are in very unique family situations uh, by not being raised with birth and step parents. Um, so we got together and uh, formed a nonprofit. And a year later, we received some federal funding to allow us to hire some staff and to expand our services throughout Northern Virginia. So I know both of you were foster parents before you were adoptive parents. So Dee, what was that journey like for you? Well, we started out um, deciding, contemplating either um, f adopting a baby from birth or possibly through the foster care system. So we started out both concurrently and foster care came through first for us. And so we went, doors opened and we went through them. Um, and so we had two boys that we got when they were quite young <clears throat> and we ended up fostering them for four long tumultuous years, um, which is not really normal. It doesn't usually take that long and it, it uh, isn't usually that rocky, but um, we were blessed to be able to adopt them five years later. And um, we had tremendous challenges. I mean, it. it we really were not, even though we went through all of the training through Fairfax County Department of Family Services that they offered, um, and we thought we were ready, we didn't know what we didn't know. <laughs> and so Kelly and I met through middle school PTA group, and she said, you should come to one of our <laughs> meetings. And, um, and I, was, I, was, I, I, I was sold as soon as I understood more about what they did. Well, I think when you have special needs children, it requires extra support. And I mm -hmm. like how you call them extra special children. Mm -hmm. And so you need to find your community. Mm -hmm. I mean, all moms get together and kind of mm -hmm. share the burden. But this is a specific kind of thing, especially in finding resources. You know, is that, was that kind of the focus initially, yes. Kelly? Yeah, so I think um, one of the things we did is certainly support each other, and that's really important. That continues to be part of our mission is, is providing support groups, and we have a parent uh, caregiver support group. We have a support group for youth and young adults as well, um, but also resource navigation. Because as I mentioned, we are in a very resource-rich area, but it is really hard to find specialized care for some of the unique needs that our families have. Um, a lot of our children have been impacted by trauma in their past, um, and so that has an impact on their mental health, it has their impact on significant impact on their behavioral um, success, particularly at school, and so I come to this through a special education lens. Professionally, I'm a special educator and taught special education, and. Um, worked in that and continue to work in that field, but I, the impact of these special needs is, is not short term, it is long term, and so finding appropriate resources and supports for our families are really, really critical. So I'm sure not all of these children are young, like your two right. sons were very young. There's a lot of children in the foster care system who are older. Yes. Right. You know, how difficult is it to find a place for them? So most children in the foster care, in the public foster care system, are actually age seven and older. Um, a large majority are. Um, and it is really challenging, as, as you know, to um, find 
permanent homes um, that will sustain and support a child into young adulthood. And of course those needs don't disappear when a child turns 18. No. Um, and so that is a continuing uh, challenge. And that's sometimes where kinship care uh, comes in. Uh, but maybe Dee can talk a little bit about some of the challenges you know, with the foster in, care. Yeah, the Kinship Institute mm -hmm. in, in that in Fairfax County, I've heard it statewide. Mm -hmm. You know, and I love the concept the minute I heard it. And so explain a little bit about why that focus has shifted to kinship care. Well, I think kinship care, um, I, th I, think it, I think we've had it for a long time. I just think that those grandparents and, and, and family members have been struggling um, in and they silence. And that, no, not necessarily in the system either. Correct. And that I know that, that funding grandparents and relatives who have taken on right. children because you're not part of the system, you are also not financially supported. Like, that has to be a hurdle. Yeah, yeah, I think they're triple special in that sense <laughs> because um, they're, they're sort of outside of what we now think of as the normal foster adoptive situation. Yeah, and, and, um, and maybe, you know, are older, and so it, it's, it's especially challenging for them. And I think that they feel a very strong sense of commitment to, to finding a way to make it work. Um, and a lot of relief from a lot of the services that Foreign Family Support and other sorts of um, organizations can provide. You know, and I can understand, you know, meeting through a PTA, mm -hmm. or that's how you, can, you know, knew of each other, but there has to be people mm -hmm. out there, especially if you're grandparents, where you're trying to take care of your children and maybe you're not as active in the PTA and you're a whole different generation mm -hmm. from younger parents. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big issue because, again, we deal with a lot of education issues and it's been a long time since some of the grandparents mm -hmm. um, and sometimes even aunts and uncles who step in um, have been parenting in a school uh, setting. And so the technology has changed, how you keep track of grades and assignments and all those kinds of things has changed drastically. How you parent has changed drastically in the world of electronics. Um, so they are really learning. Um, on all fronts and really need support. Not only just how to do it and the, the, the nuts and bolts, but support from others that are living the same um, challenges and experiences and, and the joys um, that come along with it. And so often they get very little time to prepare. Uh, you mentioned for informal foster, excuse me, informal kinship care where there's no supports or very few public supports. And then some families do foster officially, they are kinship providers, but they are in the foster care system. Um, and that's a growing number um, that are beginning to get some of those supports, but that is a whole other set of challenges. There's training and supports that have to be um, considered. Uh, and sometimes it's across state lines, it's across jurisdictional mm -hmm. lines. Um, you might have a grandchild in uh, another state completely and suddenly they are on your doorstep. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of change and transition, and so they really do face um, huge barriers at, at times, especially in our area where housing is, is, uh, is right. a factor to consider. If you have moved to your, your retirement um, mm -hmm. community or your retirement phase of your life, you might not have those extra bedrooms. Um, you might not have the resources that you might need uh, typically to raise a child in Northern Virginia. So they face a lot of challenges and so we're really pleased that we're able to provide supports. Um, we have other organizations and agencies. You mentioned the Kinship Family Institute, which is a new effort of uh, Fairfax County uh, to provide resource navigation as well as some training. And there are training specific topics that really m uh, make a difference to kinship, to foster, and to to adoptive families that are unique from the needs of other families. So in talking about unique needs, we, when we talk about disability, that is a wide range, is it not? And mm -hmm. some disabilities, when we think of, dis you know, so often you think of disabilities, you think of somebody in a wheelchair, mm -hmm. not someone with intellectual or de developmental disabilities, and yet that community, the IDD community, is growing pretty quickly. So, you know, Dee, how do you try to help, how does your organization try to help families who might have a wide range of very unique situations with their children? Yeah, I think what Foreign Families Forward does um, really well is a lot of consult. So, so people find out about us through a number of different means and then they can ring us and, and um, it might be a specific question, it might be a specific event, uh, you know, a meeting, an IEP meeting or a meeting with social workers and, and others that they have to get prepared for and they're sort of freaking out and on the ledge and they don't know what to expect or what their rights are or, or what to consider or what to ask and so we can um, what Kelly does very well exceptionally well is is 
is talk to them on the phone and connect them with all these different resources. Um, <clears throat> maybe they need someone to go with them to these meetings. Um, maybe they just need to learn more about um, where their rights are online or written down or what have you. Um, and so these one-on-one -on -one consults are super valuable. Um, we also offer trainings. So that's, a, that's more on the proactive side of things um, that people can sign up for. They're often no cost, uh, sometimes low cost um, because of our, our um, federal funding. Um, Kelly mentioned the, the support groups. We have peer-to-peer -peer support groups and parent support groups. Um, it, it, it's um, ever-changing. Well, you know, it's, in this, but it's marvelous that it's there at all. Mm -hmm. You know, so my question is, so how do people find you? Mm -hmm. You know, like, I'd never heard of you, but then, you know, mm -hmm. I don't have a children that age. You mm -hmm. know, I, going back to your thing about the IEP, the first time I sat down in an IEP, mm -hmm. I was like, what is this? Right. And, you know, and it was a table full of people. It was like exactly. social work and the assistant principal and the special education teacher. And I'm like, you know, you feel kind of outnumbered and overwhelmed. And... Absolutely. But you know, and, but you, you kind of just do it, you know, I can remember burning all of his IEP papers in right. a pit, fire pit <laughs> right. with my next door neighbors when it was all over. I mean, my youngest is now almost 30, right. <laughs> but it's kind of like, oh, thank goodness I will never have to do this right. again. It is so overwhelming and confusing. And I, you know, I didn't, I just had to just go with it. And consider that's almost doubled when you're dealing with a child who's in public custody, uh, who's in foster care, mm -hmm. and maybe within a, a, a foster family, um, and so has multiple uh, caregivers involved, multiple agency personnel, in addition to just the school folks around the table. So a parent uh, or caregiver can feel overwhelmed by the fact that they're walking into a meeting with 20, 25 Social people. workers and GALs and it just... Even more people. Yes. I mean, there yep. were a lot of people yes. around the table. but but but. Public custody, now you bring up something, generally getting certain kinds of accommodations for your child or being involved in the IEP process, you're the, you're the parent. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're not the parent, how in the world does that work? So we're really fortunate. Um, it, this is not the case in all domains, but in special education under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, the IDEA, it's very clear that uh, the sort of chain of, of uh, who would serve as a parent to a child with a disability. Um, and so. Uh, if the birth parent is still involved and, has, and rights have not been terminated, but the birth parent is still uh, involved with the child, they and they choose to be at the meeting, they act as parent. If they're not acting as parent, the foster parent is the educational decision maker under mm -hmm. IDEA. And that's something that sometimes a lot of school staff don't know and a lot of even public agency staff don't know. And so it's really important that foster parents understand the rights and responsibilities of a child with a disability. And not just in, uh, in education meetings, these families mm -hmm. go to lots of meetings, mm -hmm. as, as Dee will attest. Mm -hmm. There's family resource meetings. Um, there's all kinds of, uh, if a child is receiving mental health care, then there's meetings with um, uh, other groups of, of uh, family-focused uh, providers. And so it's very confusing at times what meeting you're even walking into, what what uh, people are involved in that meeting. And so understanding is sometimes the very first step, and uh, and that's part of our role is helping sort of sort out the papers. I just got this invitation. Somebody called me to do this. Help me understand. And so we start there and really help navigate. Um, and as Dee mentioned, we have trainings to also support sort of that that proactive, like what why do you want to know. We have a series, for example, of webinars right now that will be recorded on our website on fetal alcohol spectrum disorder because a lot of our children have had prenatal exposure And I to do alcohol. want to explore what kinds of things we're talking about and when we come back from our break that's exactly what we're going to do. So please join us after this break when we talk further with Formed Families Forward. It on. A message from the Foundation for a Better Life.
Welcome back to Your Need to Know. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and today we are talking with Formed Families Forward. We have the Executive Director, Kelly Henderson, with us, and Dee Robinson Rukowski, who is a former board chair. Thank you, ladies, so much for being here. So when we went on break, you were talking a little bit about specific challenges for very specific disorders, and they are varied. So you, help us understand, again, the broad spectrum of, of the disabilities that we're talking about. We, um, <clears throat> we have focused a lot on ADD and ADHD and how families can uh, manage that as well as even um, schools and counselors and those sorts of those professionals that also have to have to handle, have to manage these children um, throughout their day. Um, lately we've had um, a, a good focus on fetal alcohol syndrome um, and that has been terribly well received. Um, it really is the full spectrum of issues that stem from um, trauma, early trauma for these children. You know, when I went to the South by Southwest Education Conference last year, it was the first time that I'd gone to um, sessions on trauma-focused education, mm -hmm. and I had never heard of that. Yes. And then discovered that the governor of Massachusetts in 2014 saw, signed legislation that focuses their whole education system on trauma-focused education. I'm thinking, well, that's going on my wish list for Virginia, yeah. yes. because trauma is at the basis, and there's so many ways in which children are traumatized. And we have good news in Virginia. Um, we have a trauma, a whole network of trauma-informed community networks, TICNs. And Fairfax Sweet. has a great trauma-informed community network. And the state is beginning to support those trauma-informed community networks. And there's, um, there's a lot of action in the state. I think there's a beginning recognition um, and growing recognition of the impact of trauma, not only in schools, which is significant, but across domains. Um, and the, the breadth of trauma that sometimes, we're, you know, we're not talking about a natural disaster or a one-time event. We're talking often about a set of circumstances that a child was um, exposed to. Uh, the, the term ACEs, Adverse Childhood yes. Experiences, is yes. getting a I lot Yes, I learned that more. one too. Yes. Um, and so I think people are beginning to understand that those early experiences, particularly even in the baby and infant um, stages of life, have significant impacts. And we may not always know even the extent of those experiences, but we know that there are strategies that can be used, put into place, that are good for all kids. Um, we don't have to have proof that a trauma had occurred for us to use proactive, um, appropriate strategies. And a lot of it is about the relationship. Um, all of our training as foster parents and adoptive parents has focused a lot on um, that in the importance of relationship and that really is echoed in the information that's coming out about trauma. Even if that is not a, a child that's in a, a foster, adoptive, or kinship family, that relationship, with, be it from the child to the teacher, the child to an uh, after-school provider, uh, the child to a relative that is uh, an important person in their life is hugely important. That's the basis for which then they can learn to regulate and, and develop develop those executive function skills and begin the process of recovery and resiliency. So I have a question about foster care, you know, sometimes children are there temporarily, mm -hmm. sometimes they're not, and, you know, and obviously long-term family structures are always going to be in the best interest of a child, a stable environment. How many of the families that you work with, are, are they all families that ultimately have adopted or are they foster families that are still fostering? <coughs> I think it's the full spectrum. I think that we have, I think that we have some um, clients, some some people that come to us for support, that are um, only interested in fostering, and so they just have children who, for some reason, are temporarily in foster care, but either plan to go back with their bio parents or with other relatives. Um, but there's some temporary nature to their needing care. Um, then there are some who know that they want to adopt and um, have adopted, didn't want to do foster care, thought that that would be too hard, and so only wanted the kids that were available for adoption. So we have those parents that come to us and need support. And then the, the hybrid is those that foster to adopt, like I did, where you right. foster first and you hope that it will go to adoption and sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it doesn't. Um, and then the piece that we mentioned earlier is kinship, um, all of them. So it really, there's no cookie cutter um, uh, c client that comes to us. It's the full range of scenarios that we might encounter. And we also serve internationally adopted and privately adopted children. So those are children that 
the family has made, the birth family has made arrangements, um, uh, mm -hmm. are no longer able to take care of the child, and so they don't necessarily enter a foster care or public care situation, mm -hmm. and that, uh, that adoption is a legal arrangement that's made privately. I mean, we have a lot of adoptive families that, mm -hmm. um, in our area particularly, um, that come to uh, their families through international adoption or private adoption, um, and they also carry uh, sometimes unique challenges mm -hmm. in their circumstances, and that may be at any age, but a lot of those tend to be a little bit younger um, in terms of the time that they arrive with their family of, of uh, their permanent home. Right, and, and I happen to know, I have a friend who was in that situation, adopted an infant, mm -hmm. and the infant, you know, is special needs. I mean, yeah. he's, he's growing and thriving and is doing incredibly well, but when you adopt an infant particularly, then you don't, nobody knows anyway. You have a baby, yeah. believe me, I had three of them. You just get what you get. But Sometimes you know and sometimes you don't sometimes know Sometimes you later. don't know, and, and so, but you get what you get. So in this fostering situation, how many of the kids who are put into foster care already have been identified? And how many kids go into foster care who have not been diagnosed or evaluated and then the foster family finds out because there are issues after the fact that this child, I mean, so that's really, it's a good question and it's one we don't have a really great answer to because the data is really hard to collect on special needs generally because that definition varies from one sector to another sector. Education has a fairly uh, uh, careful definition of who is a child with a disability that, that is determined by eligibility and categories, but in the, the public social services world and child welfare, um, sometimes that definition is, is broader. A special needs child in foster care may be one who ha is older but it might be hard to place, might have siblings that also need to be placed. And so special needs can mean many things. But generally, uh, from what we know from smaller studies, we say about three to five times the rate, the, uh, the prevalence of disabilities and special needs in a foster, adoptive, and kinship population than for, for um, a population raised by their birth and step families. Um, so it is, it is significant, we know that, and you're, you raised a question of under-identification, and mm -hmm. Dee can probably speak to, to that, that sometimes folks have good intentions of not wanting to identify or make judgments too early, and sometimes that, that may not be the best thing for a child. Yeah, yeah our, our boys really had challenges later that maybe in a perfect world they would have been identified earlier and we just did not have enough training to deal with them and so we had to fast track to to get more resources um, around us and, and luckily that's right when I came into contact with Kelly um, and so she was part of our, our 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 new team to help scaffold these boys to help them develop well. well what, why I asked that question is having just recently talked with um, Shannon Duncan from Decoding Dyslexia Virginia and the fact that because children are not screened early mm -hmm. oftentimes dyslexia is another one of those things mm -hmm. third or fourth I'm sure. grade I'm sure and then they're already behind mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so <clears throat> is that one of the things you help parents to navigate if they think their child may need testing oh yeah you yeah. point them in the right direction absolutely mm -hmm. absolutely and again especially in a situation where a child has transitioned fairly recently to their, their home, whether it's foster, a kinship, or adoption home, adoptive home. Um, sometimes our families experience a little bit of barriers and they're saying, well, just give them some more time. Just mm -hmm. give them some more time. And the family's like, I know there's an issue. I know, I see this. Mm -hmm. I think there's a processing issue. And so helping families navigate those systems and understand their rights to refer for um, educational services and for other services, medical and mental health services are often also helpful to many of our families um, and not having to wait till the situation gets really sort of drastic um, is really important and so that's part of part of what we do and we have a great resource directory mm -hmm. um, I was just going to mention that yes in addition to them calling reaching out to us coming to our web page getting these referrals we have an amazing resource directory that is free and available on our web page so if if for some reason they can't reach us or don't want to talk to somebody or you know it's after hours or I don't, I don't know what the scenario might be but there's that resource there that they can they can help themselves navigate if you will hundreds of resources in that um, private providers that do have trauma training and have specialized experience in particular issues that may be of uh, 
of commonality to our population. And so we, we're really pleased to be able to offer that and update it every year so that the most recent information on different practices and agencies and organizations and connecting to folks like Decoding Dyslexia and the ARC of Northern Virginia, folks that can help navigate some of those, those points as well. Yeah, and I heard Cree Deed <coughs> speak yesterday, was it yesterday? Um, when I was down with the League of Women Voters in Richmond and he was talking about funding for mental health services, yes. which there's never enough of, and certainly not community-based mental health services. And I, you know, that's just, we need, we need more resources, period. And I know that, yeah. that, you know, mental health issues for young people can be problematic for not having, he was talking about the fact that there's no pediatric psychiatrist west of Lynchburg. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's a problem. I mean, you can't even refer to somebody that doesn't exist. We are fortunate in Fairfax County that we are rich in resources, but it's still tough to navigate. And these are some of the topics that we cover in our events. And one of our big events coming up is Spring Forward. It's our sixth year of Spring Forward. It's a family fun day that's ideal for foster, adoptive, and kinship families. And this year we're adding a professional track. This year it will be um, April 27th, Saturday, in uh, Manassas at the GMU Science and Technology Campus. Great activities for kids that keep them happy while their parents and caregivers and professionals get really great opportunity to learn and connect and have some time to themselves um, and, and find out some of the resources that are available to them. Well, I can't thank you both enough for being on the show. I mean, you have enlightened me because I didn't know any of this existed. You know, who should come, Dee, to this event on the 27th of April? Who should come? Anybody that has um, <clears throat> foster, adoptive, um, domestically, um, internationally, uh, families um, formed through those, those means, kinship providers, and frankly, anybody who cares about these individuals can even come and learn more. Because one thing that, um, that we need to realize is even if our kids are not traumatized and not special needs. There are kids in our kids' classrooms that are, That's on true. our sports teams, um, that we have birthday parties with and outings with, and so we all can um, learn and we all can, can, can do our part. And I think that's so important, and I hope that people will consider working with you in other ways, supporting you. I'm sure, you know, you, it costs money, you've got federal funds, but certainly... We are always, <laughs> always happy for donations of, of time and treasure. Absolutely, <laughs> because it's, it's, it's a lot to provide these kind of resources, and I'm sure more and more families would like to take advantage of those resources, so thank you very much. I have learned a lot today. Thank you, Dee, and thank you, Kelly. Thank you for thank the opportunity. You. We're, we're glad so to much. let folks know about Foreign Families Forward, and hope to see you at Spring Forward. Uh, absolutely, and this is what you need to know. <laughs>